Thank you. Thank you for President Lee for the kind introduction. Thank you um, everyone for attending this keynote and all of those that are online. Uh, feel free to prepare questions. I will try to leave some space for discussion at the end of my keynote. And of course, I'm available for uh, any email interaction. So you will see my email popping up in the occasional slides. Uh, before I start, I would also like to thank um, uh, first, I would like to ask you to read my automatically translated Korean text, which is therefore maybe not perfect, but you have to acknowledge that I, I the only thing I know how to do is to count. So I, I would be able to say how many of you are in the room if I had the time to count you, but I, I estimate, let me do my best uh, Korean, I estimate we have in the room maybe uh, Paul Ship E person. Uh, that's my best estimation so far, uh, but I don't want to spend time talking about that. Anyway, um, so thank you also for for me for hosting me again. I, I was in in this conference a few years ago. That was July um, 19 before the, the, the COVID pandemic, and actually a few days before uh, we stopped flying around, we actually hosted in Lisbon this uh, joint symposium. Uh, and, and somehow someone took this wonderful picture that you can see in the, in the slide um, of me greeting some of the, of the colleagues of that, uh, of that group that just arrived. So we are ready to, to go. <laughs> We're ready to go. Um, and today, um, the, the, the abstract you have on my presentation is, is, is as follows. Um, I think I want to highlight uh, looking at the personal health data spaces from patient empowerment perspective and citizen participation. And I know the topic of citizens and citizen activism in, in, in Korea is something that uh, I believe you're still finding your way through how to make that useful for digital health advances. And then I also um, want to look at these topics um, and, and, and through the thinking of a topic that I've noticed during this week here in, in, in Korea uh, that is growing of interest, which is the healthcare uh, metaverse. And, and I provoke you with some ideas on that as well. So this is the structure of our keynote. Um, I know you, you, you like to have everything well structured. I've, I've learned that lesson from the many interactions. Um, so I will be covering uh, what I would call the basis and, and, and two conceptual bases, health data space as a concept and, and the different types of health data spaces that one can think of, and then digital twins. Um, then, then a brief, brief slides on precision public health as I see it moving uh, finally after COVID. Uh, although some of my slides were pre-COVID, and I was already talking about this uh, in our national strategy for big data and public health uh, um, data sets in Portugal in, in 2019. But anyway, now it's kind of obvious that we do need to do precision public health uh, or personalized public health. You know, Americans um, more on the precision word, Europeans more on the personalized word, but anyway, kind of the same thing. And then, some reflections on healthcare metaverse and how I think it is useful for delivering value. And I think that is the key question. How does it deliver value for patients? Um, and then what experimentation, what risks and what direction should we take into, into this new uh, or, or not so new? And I'm going to challenge the concept that it is a new thing, uh, but it's still a buzzword. And I've learned through working with ministers and governments and also the European Commission that one needs buzzwords to keep politicians entertained and interested in what I call fundamental work. So you, you need to find a balance between medical informatics work, fundamental research, what I would call basic research, also in the informatics area, and what is then more appealing, more interesting, more politically interesting, and, and, and in a way more engaging also for citizens and professionals. And, and we need to learn to find a balance. So let's start, see if I don't get too late, 
um, data about the individual's health and care. It's the most common type of health data. And, and you see a map of all the types of data sets that one could create out of a person, structured, unstructured, uh, be it medication, demographics, you know, you can, you can look at the map. Uh, this is uh, from a very interesting uh, um, online uh, article. Um, as a contribution to the European health data space discussion. Then we have secondary use of data. You know, normally you have things like national registries or data about health professionals' capacity and system capacity, much less often found in, in countries. So countries tend to have good national registries. Korea certainly is one of them. Um, I remember doing a study on, on comparing countries in Slovenia, uh, sorry, uh, Sweden, Korea uh, ranked super high in the quality of national registries, uh, Finland as well. But when you ask them, for example, do you have a national registry of healthcare professionals? Do you know what, how many doctors have the capacity to put an uh, IV line on the, on the neck of a baby? Most countries in the world do not know. They do not have a database that, that, that takes into account the competencies of the workforce. It's not to know how many doctors you have. That, that, is meaningless. And again, COVID has shown us that it is pointless to know how many beds a hospital has. The question is how many beds does the hospital have that have certain conditions, oxygen, ventilator, um, and then how many of those beds will have an intensivist, will have a high specialized nurse, will have access to a certain type of IT equipment. That is the question you need to answer these days. It's not how many beds a hospital has. So it doesn't impress me when someone says, my hospital has a thousand beds. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but there's hospitals in some parts of the world that are not very developed that have 2,000 beds, but they are useless compared with five beds in other countries for a certain type of problem. And that, that is the question one needs to address. Public health data and indicators, and in a report that I will tell you a little bit about that I've written for the European Parliament, um, I had to break down this concept of public health data and, and indicators and find that and, and try to discuss with public health people that public health data is not just the typical data about, you know, how many cancer cases and how many, you know, infections and how many uh, monkeypox cases. It's also uh, health is also data about the health system, as I was explaining, the capacity of the system, but also a very relevant type of data, which we don't tend to think it's our data, but it is, which is what I call data with public health relevance. So, for example, the, the movement of citizens uh, within the taxes of um, Seoul is very important. If you want to really identify emerging, emerging patterns of disease, you would need to know who has gone into that taxi during the day. And today we have that data. Most of you book through, I'm, I cannot say the words of the companies, although they are Korean, so either cacao or uh, chocolate or naver or whatever. So there's all these things that you can just go online and get a taxi and they show up to you. But other people have been in that taxi during that day. But the big difference is we no longer have to ask the taxi driver, how many people did you drive that day and who were in the same day in the taxi with this one case? So this was the old public health. And I normally say to the public health people, you know, forget your old methods, epidemiology and all of those methods. This is completely outdated. We now have technology for that. Now, quickly, data spaces. What is a data space? Now, I, I would say that a data space is the next generation of the word data lake, okay? That's my first comment. So data lake, was the type of topic, was the type of word you would use when you talk with IT people. It's a bunch of data put together in, uh, in, in a box, let's call it this way, right? Uh, um, a relationship um, database, uh, server or two connected, whatever. In, when we started talking about data spaces um, in Europe, we started thinking that data space is, yes, a big storage of data or maybe more. It is a semantic organization of that data. It is the discussion of access rights and ownership rights. It's the concept that initially we started talking about data donation, and then we found out that 
altruism was a better word and the final word that we put on, on the EU legislation that was actually finally approved last month uh, is uh, data altruism um, to avoid the idea of donation on return, on money, so data selling and data economics for the person. Uh, but it's also, uh, data space is also a space of harmonization and it's also the evolution, the natural evolution of e-government to what I call de-government, data-based governance. So we start governing, so the, you know, the e-governance uh, uh, used to be that, you know, you, you, you get your driving license online and you do all these transactions with your government online and Korea has a, a wonderful e-government strategy that I will show you the slide from a few years ago that I recovered from my uh, other presentations. But, but actually governments are now changing for data governance, um, not the governance of data, but governance of the people based on data. And this raises a lot of issues, as you can imagine, particularly now in Europe with the war with Russia. So um, this is a very interesting hot topic, maybe for the next, uh, uh, for the next uh, keynote or session. Anyway, data space is where you store, where you access, where you fudge, where you mix data, where you experiment with data. So that's we, we start talking about digital twins and we start talking about synthetic uh, data uh, creation. Um, we recover the elements and all the, the vision about big data that is now not fashion anymore. Very few people talk about big data. I was screening through the abstracts of the conference. There's like 30 something abstracts that the word algorithm is there. And I, I rarely see the word big data, but if it was like five years ago, it would have been very frequent. And then, and then data spaces are the basis for AI because they need data and for metaverse creations, if we ever get there. So you've, you've read some of the things of the Data Governance Act and, um, and what is a data space from a legal perspective. So the vision is that um, the data spaces are these spaces where um, um, which data could be used irrespective of its physical storage location in the union in compliance with applicable law, which inter alia, amongst other things, Latin, could be pivotal for the rapid development of artificial intelligence te uh, technology. So that is the sort of the vision. And the first area where we talked about data spaces was health, which is quite strange. If you ever uh, come to study more on, on Europe, you will know that health is not a priority. It started as an economical area, um, but yet it's the first area that is mentioned. And actually the first legislation was on the health data space. I will talk to you about it in a second. And also in this legislation, we talk about that personal data spaces could be linked to this other space. So I'll talk to you about personal data spaces. What, what is the personal data space? The first thing you have to understand is the difference between a personal data space, electronic health record and personal health record. So, and it's easy. Normally a medical health record or a electronic health record is a record built by documentation from professionals, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, or from machines, a laboratory machine, gets hold of your blood, produces a data set, hemoglobin equals 12 gram, uh, grams per deciliter. It's a data about you, it was produced by a machine. Personal health uh, records, the concept that the person documents its own health. Personal health data, personal data spaces is a conglomerate of all this data, data produced about you, data produced by you, and data obtained from all your interactions with digital components like your car, like your um, cacao interactions uh, and other online media, and, and put together into one single space. And actually, I have to say, that we didn't write the word metaverse there, but the guys writing this, they are very good. Now that I've studied a little bit of law, I have learned that when you're writing law, you should write it in a way that it is future-proof. If you read the, 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 the last line that I have underlined, look at what it says. Personal data spaces containing personal data, such as, which means any type of data, but including the name, okay? As, as well as, so everything, 
and dynamic data, so any other type of dynamic data that an individual generates through, for example, so other things is possible, the use of online services or object connected to the Internet of Things. So when people talk about now the, the word will be metaverse, one could read an, this is an object connected to the Internet of Things. Okay? So, so I think this is useful. What do we know, what do we, how can we help uh, as medical informaticians? I will tell you, interoperability and architecture. I see finally some abstracts on SNOMAD, very proud. Uh, I see finally that people still write occasionally about architectures. I saw one, uh, one abstract on distributed processing for analytics. But my friends, at least from where I come from, architecture was key. The fact that we could conceive of a federated architecture for the European health data space allowed the legislation to go further. If we had talked about putting all the data together in one single database, like the old times, it would never have been accepted. So it is the work that we do in these conferences it is the word that we do in science, in informatic science, that sometimes allows vision to come through. So rules of datification. How are we going to datify all the procedures in medicine? Rules on data representation, data modeling, interoperability, translation issues, translation services, key not just in Korea, but also in Europe, of course, with all the other languages. Um, so this is slide is just for those of you that are more interested in sort of European context. These are the key legislations that are going out and you see from the dates it's very recent. Everything is happening at the same time. New data legislation, new health data legislation, new cybersecurity legislation, um, data donation and one thing which is not a law but it's something that I started writing about and I really believe it's going to be very important is what I call health data activism. It's a movement I believe will happen in Europe at least but across the world progressively which is we will see more and more patient associations claiming not attention from governments for treatment but asking governments to take care of their data and take good care of their data and what is to take good care of your data as a patient association is to make sure your data is used explored researched about and made to produce new drugs and new medicines and new devices but i'll talk more about that so this is a summary slide on on the on the proposal and and and, and what is it all about it's about sharing health data for healthcare so what we call primary use of health data so you have a discharge letter from one hospital in Belgium and you receive that hospital discharge letter in your hospital in Portugal and that data goes into the database of the hospital in Portugal. So we have to standardize these data sets and we have five domains of attention we are working on. The second dimension, access to health data for research and policy making, what we call in Europe secondary use of health data. And then the idea of a single market for digital health services, so EHR certification. So one, one thing that it will happen with this regulation is the, the, the creation of certification schemas for electronic health records. And then, of course, creating the basis for data for AI software uh, applications. Now, what about national data spaces? Well, national data space is the same concept, and I bring some ideas of what's happening in my country and your country as I see it, of course, with limited perspective. So in our case, we wrote this, this report from Big Data to Smart Health in 2019, um, and where we realized this vision of the INHS, uh, Intelligence Health Service, um, built on robust data governance with four core values that I think are useful in many countries. Maintaining public trust, high quality data, which means working on data capturing, easy to use uh, electronic health records, uh, well-structured semantics and ontology and so on and so forth. Efficiency through data integration, make data really change the game for healthcare, make cheap care, cheaper care because you've used healthcare data, and finally, data-driven innovation, uh, which, of course, is linked to the AI, uh, um, the AI momentum that we see now. We see, finally, AI solutions helping radiologists, helping gastroenterologists, detecting polyps, and things like that. 
uh, and and this is this was the this was the work we've done home, uh, organizing this into five areas, and uh, and the one that I would like to call your attention today is this culture of innovation and collaboration. So working on a national health data space is also creating communities for uh, exploring data and creating communities of innovation. And, and these were uh, the backbones for secondary use of data. And then, you know, this was sort of the, the, the rollout in terms of time. And you see that this was written, as I normally say, in the era of AI, 19, 2000. Now, at least in Europe, we are living the last of the telemedicine, telehealth era. So by the end of this year, we will finish the telehealth, telemedicine um, uh, momentum. And I think 20, 2023, maybe metaverse, I'm not sure. Maybe, I don't, I'm not sure. Here it is a buzzword, over there it's not yet, but, but we see a lot of AI, uh, uh, um, um, augmented reality, virtual reality topic coming up. Um, but I think we are going back, actually, to the topic of the big data, exactly because of the European health data space. This, in 2018, was our vision in, in Lisbon. We already had authorized by our data protection board since 2012, the creation of RICA, which was the clinical anonymized repository. And uh, the idea in 2018 was to use the patient portal to contact 3 million people and ask them, would you okay that we use your data for research? And we will tell you who the researcher is. And if you want to know when he published data, when he published a paper with using your data, we will also let you know. So this was our vision. And actually, I'm very happy to say that this vision is not only our vision, it's now the vision discussed in Brussels. Right now, I'm part of the consent harmonization uh, working group, where we're working across Europe to harmonize consent for data altruism. So asking the patient, we have this data about you from these hospitals, from these national registries, do you allow us to use it for this specific purpose, this researcher? Professor Lee, Professor X, Professor Y, okay? And he does this type of research, and this is his research proposal. This is what will come out of your data. Maybe an improvement on diabetes treatment, maybe a new device. In Korea, uh, in 2018, I had a presentation uh, from your uh, Ministry of um, Security or something. I don't remember. Wait, one second. Ministry of the Interior and Safety at the time was called like that. Uh, and it was about the he government. Uh, and, and, and you see that, you know, you have done a lot of work. So you have the basis for, for moving forward in, in many things. But what I found interesting in both these presentations from a ministry which is not health is that health is rarely referred. So there's a lot of documents about services and economy but health sector is perhaps less participant. So I think one of the challenges here is how does the Korean national health data space looks like? And, um, and this is a recent news from uh, February this year, um, discussing the issue on telemedicine that you still have, and we will be working on that in July on an online conference. But which has to do with, uh, with uh, not being possible to, to, to do teleconsultations directly doctor to the patient. Um, I found one paper on this, but there's of course many more. So it's coming, right? It's coming, especially thanks to the project My Data. Um, but, but what does this mean and how does it link to personal health data spaces and data altruism? It's a question. Now, what is a personal health data space? Um, thinking through personal health data space uh, with others is always better. So we come up with this paper, it's a small paper, it's not even in a sort of a super academic journal um, that I wrote with N1 and uh, Catherine Kronaki from HL7 and uh, Giovanni from Pfizer. Um, and, and we write about uh, personal health data space as being the space where people use data in four levels of sophistication. The first level the more basic level is access to your data, accumulate your, your data in a, in a safe place. OK, 
Okay. The second level of usage is when you can use your personal health data space to curate your data, to edit and delete data. That will allow people to help us in healthcare do better with their own data. And this is something we launched in Portugal in 2017, for example, with the national vaccination record. We put the vaccines open to the people and then we asked them, could you double check if this is correct? And if it's not correct, send us an email. And this helped us a lot find out some mistakes that we had because we had to migrate to 22 million records from more than 400 databases from the past. So in doing that, if we had done it by ourselves, we would have done it and we did it. But doing it with the people, we did it better. Uh, and that is the difference between doing a personal health data space linked to a national health data space or just doing a national project. Third level, visualizing and then supporting your everyday life with the data you have about you. So the fact that you have data about you should enable you to cope with your challenges in life, with your health challenges, but also with your life challenges, with your lack of health. So it's about trust, integrity and overview, capacity to see myself alive and autonomous through the usage of my data. And these two levels, these two higher levels, visualizing and supporting everyday life is also something that links to the avatarization of the, the citizen. And I'll talk more about this in a moment. Uh, so what is health data activism? So I've already mentioned to you about this concept is the attitude and actions that a person or organization may have in the promotion of the rights to the seamless access and the best use of health data. That is our proposal for this movement. And I think we are now one of my master's students. She's working on a very interesting project, which is a survey of more than 400 patient associations across Europe and ask them simple questions. Have you ever thought about data? Do you know what to demand out of data? And do you have any activity that we could label health data activism? Now, I said the word avatarization of patients in the sense that, you know, we've been talking about this digital twins even before the metaverse buzzword came out. Um, now the question is, what, what, what are the implications for, the, for them? And today I don't have the time to talk about the avatarization of professionals, but I already told you that I believe we need to catch more data on what our professionals do and who they are and what are their competency set. But let's continue with patients for now. So regarding post-COVID public health, I already talked. Uh, but summary slide is, I think, useful. Subpopulation interventions. We need to start focusing on populations, subpopulations, family interventions, based not on our preconceptual notion that, ah, we have Indian families in Portugal, so for the Indian families, we're going to do this intervention. No, that's not the point. The point is families at risk for a certain behavior. It's not the fact that they're Indian or Korean. It's the fact that they have a certain behavior that puts them at risk. Now, how do we capture that behavior? Digitalizing uh, behavioral data. What are they buying? Are they buying too much salt? Are they buying too much uh, fat? That's, that's the families we, we want to target if we want to do a target intervention on promotion of uh, avoiding salt. Uh, Portuguese eat four times more salt than they should every day. Can you imagine? They're getting salted every day. Um, and, and you need to intervene on this. But not all of them are eating too much salt. It's an average. Behavioral change and new approaches to behavioral change using di digital technology, meta experiences, or precision. And I think this all bundles together. Intelligent public health is uh, the new health indicators for health administration and public health surveillance built on, based on real-time data and not on survey data. Uh, use an integrated approach, so joining this personal health data space with national health data space to create public health uh, data information. And 
what what I've talked about in, in some things that I've done, and I'll show you where you can read more if you're interested in public health informatics, which is uh, early warning systems for outbreak detection. But they have to be more modern than the ones we used in COVID, because the ones for COVID in some countries didn't re work really well. So if you're interested, you can read about this in, in, this, uh, in this study that I've done on the, on the Health Data Center for, uh, for Europe uh, and a common strategy for public health data. This is a long report, 70 pages, but you know, the summary slide is this one. So if we are to have a full European strategy on how to collect data for preventing, detecting and curing diseases, and you can take the word European and put Korean because I, I think it's more or less the same. So it is uh, a strategy that allows preparedness, capacity building, reporting, using all types of data relevant for health, not just typical health data. Technology-based, it is foresight and horizon scanning for emerging threats, and it focuses on the datification of vertical public health data pipelines. And, and then you see here the different elements of that strategy. If you're interested, just take a, a picture or a screenshot and, and we can also talk more about this. Now, um, very quickly, uh, I will dedicate my last uh, maybe eight or ten minutes and then I want to give you the opportunity for questions um, uh, on, the, on this buzzword, the metaverse, right? And I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that there are disruptive innovations coming. Uh, when you think about innovation, uh, some people defend that disruptive innovation and, and radical innovation is about you know, new models of care or new technologies. Uh, when you combine both, so innovation that is both using new technology like IoT, but also creating a new business model, then we talk about architectural innovation. So I would say that these last five where I have included advancements in telemedicine, which is interesting, you know, the old concept is now coming back as an innovation. And it's an innovation because it is changing the business models. At least in Europe, there's a radical change in how we are taking care of patients uh, through telehealth. Um, I'm engaged with two national telehealth strategies, the one for Slovenia and the one for Latvia. And it's literally leapfrogging. These are countries, in case of Latvia, that have never used it, and they're already talking about establishing a national center, quality assurance, in spectral function. So it's a very advanced perspective. Now, this uh, article, if you have not time enough to read all the things I've suggested, particularly if you are interested in this metaverse, I would strongly advise you to read this article because it's, the first author is Korean, as a first reason. So you're consuming domestic uh, intelligence. Uh, also, it is one of the articles that I, I like the title. I really like the title. I love titles that are provocative. And look at this title. All one needs to know. You know, that's uh, super. You know, that's <laughs> like the typical arrogant uh, academic title. But it's good. It's a good title. And the thing is, they do a good job. You know, it's more than 270 references, um, but it is a great mind that has written this because it's very clear and it talks about these 14 dimensions of the metaverse and the one i want you to capture the attention is this avatar so in order to create this digital patient that is going to live in this virtual space or this digital professional we need to have data about him okay now he then discusses these authors then discuss the details of these uh, 14 elements, technological components, and ecosystems. And as you can read from the technological components, everything is included. So everyone's been working on the metaverse and you didn't know it, right? So you leave the room today knowing that you've been working at the, in the metaverse for the, the last five years or the last two years. Just you didn't know about it because if you read it, it's all there. Data storage, data interoperability, connected devices, human-robot interaction. So half of you have been working in the metaverse and the other half will work in the metaverse according to these authors. Now, what I want to call your attention is that they talk about the importance of these digital twins. The digital twin is a methodology, is a technology, it is a process of creating in the virtual world something, not just a patient, but a professional or a process or even a structure, be it a biological structure, a heart, be it a physical structure like a hospital. 
And it's this duality that constitutes this metaverse. So there's a physical reality and there's a virtual reality and they are linked. They are linked in a dynamic way. When I move my hand in the real world, my hand should change position in the virtual world. This is such an important concept that rarely you see a report, and um, I know this is super small and you may not understand the importance of this. This symbol means 27 prime ministers. It is the Council of European Union. So when, when the Council orders a report, it's because this topic is considered to be politically relevant in the coming years. And this report was published in March this year. And it tells politicians, it's not for health people, it tells politicians what the metaverse is, so it's easy read, it's simple to understand, but it also, look, positions health as a challenge in the metaverse, not as, a, uh, not as an area of activity, but as a challenge. And I would challenge this. This is what I think is wrong in this report. Why the hell, sorry for the expression, but that's my slide, why did we got to put in the challenges list and not in the activities? So we think that we can socialize and create and play and produce value, but health is an issue, you see? Now, I don't think health is a challenge. I think health is an opportunity. Um, and it's not just me that thinks like that. WHO thinks like that. So WHO's report, uh, WHO Euro is already looking at the metaverse topic. I'm now collaborating with the Office for Quality of Care in Athens. And, and of course, we will look more into this topic. But it's not just uh, us, uh, this um, author talks about opportunities for meta health and different opportunities. And also we have put money into this. You see here, this is the call for a grant of 5 million euros that was launched the end of uh, February this year um, to fund 5 million euros to fund the creation of an ecosystem of digital twins for health. Um, so who, who are these digital patients? Uh, because digital twins is, is an important concept, but look at um, digital patients. We are already digital patients when we use apps on our phone or on our watches to, to obtain data about ourselves. We measure increasingly our data. Uh, in this very interesting summary of the digital twin patient, you tend to see the discourse on digital patients about the genetics. So the, it's almost always about genomic data. But of course, in order to create a person, a full person in the, in the metaverse uh, space, you cannot have just genes. You need to have all sorts of data about that person. Okay? Um, so I argue that we should have a, a more sophisticated paradigm. Uh, and we should uh, cross all these intersections. How does the patient use Western medicine, traditional medicine, how does the patient see himself, but also what is the genomics, proteinomics, multiomics of the patient? And also, and this is the intersection between what the patient is and what he thinks he is and digital health, this intersection brings together the personal health data space. And then when this person interacts with the real world, we have the genome, the behaviorome, the exposome. So all of these elements will, will help. And what happens in the metaverse for health? Digital therapeutics. So another trend that is speeding up is digital therapeutics. What is digital therapeutics? The capacity to treat the disease through a software. Example, sleep dis uh, disorders. Some phobias like arachnophobia with immersive uh, solutions. So this is already happening. We already have a process for health technology assessment and we are now uh, identifying uh, in another project I've done with another student, we tried to classify digital therapeutics according to how they are more real or just virtual. And the two top are fully virtual. Treat the disorder by replacing medication. So in this case, you use a software, you use no pill, or prevent and manage a disorder. Preventive medication, let's call it this way. And the thir third and fourth option, you add value to existing medication. So it's complementary. You mix digital therapeutics with real or physical therapeutics. Now, the, the digital technology is going into us and then will take us into the digital space. 
I'll explain this again. In the beginning, no one was connected to the internet. There are still a lot of people that are not connected to internet or digital solutions. And this is a, a, a big issue when we talk about equity, when we talk about access to health. But I'm not going to discuss this topic today. If you plot connectivity to digital with the body and the mind and the personality, you see that as technology progresses from apps to uh, wearables to devices to implantables, computers, systems are going into the human body, over into the brain and over into the mind. When you talk about cognitive nanobots, this is a concept, it's not yet existent technology. Uh, micro robots, yes, it's existing technology. Cognitive nanobots are nanobots, are bots, so robots at a nanoscale that will be able to take out proteins in the brain that constitute cause for dementia or some causes of dementia. Now, then I plotted here that you could establish new connections, brain-computer interfaces, through brain implants, through transcranial uh, brain-computer interfaces, and then, for those of you that like post-humanistic uh, literature, then you talk about avatarization. So when we get hold of a person and make them into the metaspace, we are talking about this part here. <clears throat> so what is the research that we should do? First, COSME should establish a working group on the healthcare metaverse. That's my first uh, uh, take-home message for, uh, for today's work. Second, perhaps uh, society, just on this topic of the metaverse or an association or what we call in Portugal uh, innovation hub that mixes industry, academics uh, and the real people in the world, which are in this case patients associations, professional associations, so establish a, a, an association for this. So different structures to reflect or do both, have a more scientific branch, a more uh, operational science sorry, more operational, societal, commercial branch. Technological dimensions, a lot of research is needed in virtual reality, augmented reality, expanded reality. The creation of digital twins, what data do we need? What representational issues do we have? The creation of personas and creation of a person. I did theater for 13 years. To, to produce a person inside us as an actor takes effort and thinking. It's not, as, it's not a data issue only. A persona has personality. And, and you have to think, you know, how am I going to create a robot that mimics the software of the hospital and then talks to the patient and explains, oh, according to me, you have these diseases, blah, blah, blah. Right? You can imagine this, this, this interaction in the, in the virtual space. You're talking with, with, a, with a virtual face. But that face needs to have a character needs to have some sort of reality to it. So maybe drama, arts, and other uh, sciences will help you. And then legal issues. The one that I like the best is, what about if we die and our avatar doesn't die? What happens next? Or the other way around, our avatar dies in the metaverse and we haven't died yet. What do we do? We resuscitate in the metaverse? So these are interesting, challenging big questions. So finally, experimentation. I think experimentation is fundamental, perhaps thinking about metaverse hospitals, perhaps talking about, you know, specific, what I call partial metaverse experiences, like for pain management, for dementia treatment. We know these things are coming, and I think they are good things uh, that we need to experiment about, because that's how we learn. And we need to discuss fundamental human rights, liability, and ethical issues. Now, personal reflections. At lunchtime, I was challenged about what is your personal opinion about the metaverse? So first, I captured this wonderful joke online. So sorry, it's not mine, but I think it's a good one. Second, you know, are we going to call everything metaverse now? I don't think we should, right? I think we need to define boundaries. And for example, I'll give you an example of a boundary, telehealth. So a patient is real patient interacting with a virtual caregiver. When it's two virtual people, it's metaverse. So that's a good way to know that when you talk about a new telehealth project, you cannot just label it metaverse right away. 
you can say it's your way to the metaverse, but you cannot really say it's a metaverse yet. Can we start with layers, interacting with data? I gave you the example of interacting with the electronic health record, give personality to the electronic health record. Interacting with digital therapeutic solutions, this is already happening, but you know, through mobile phone, so we can get better, definitely. Interacting with real professionals, but via a, a metaverse experience. And then the final frontier, interacting with an avatar robo-doctor. So there's doctor is not there anymore. It's just a bunch of AI. You've published some work through the conference on that. Uh, now give it some form and shape and face and persona, and off you go with the robo-doctor to interact with your patients. Now the final comment I have, should we replicate our archetypes, the type of building, the type of relationships? Are we going to build a healthcare metaverse that does not solve the problems of the current healthcare system? Actually, it is going to increase the problems, problems like access or unfair access or lack of equity. Uh, I don't think we should. And. Um, Ah, uh, we don't have sound. Well, do I normally have sound for this, but it's just the music. So the the, the comment uh, this is to say, you know, just just pay attention to the video. There's a sound which is nice, but it doesn't explain anything. It's just uh, um, some music. And um, during the COVID time, I wrote this uh, small reflection paper: digital health focus on societal health perspectives, digital isolation, loneliness, and telepresence. And it's true that during COVID, we used telehealth and telepresence to bridge, the, to, to bridge loneliness. And we allowed patients to interact with families through uh, digital technologies because they were isolated, right? Um, and that was good. We used, in many parts of the world, we used many telehealth solutions to bring together doctors, patients, professionals, nurses. Now, if that is to bring together people, I think that's good. But if it is to create even more digital isolation, we need to think about it. So when someone tells me we're going to build this metaverse experience because uh, elderly people in Denmark almost all live by themselves and we need to find a solution for them to feel to together, I wonder if the solution is not to try to put them together try to convince them to live close by and not in isolation. Um, and also some technologies can help you do that. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think, uh, you know, we need to balance these things uh, and, and find a balance. And how to do that? My suggestion, design a national healthcare metaverse strategy. Set up the right team, involve your Ministry of Health. You need political, some political support, eventually some funding. International scanning intelligence, obtain the best uh, to think together with you. Think about the values and opportunities first. Think about the personas you want to create, not just the technology. You, you have very good IT companies. You have amazing uh, ecosystem for digital innovation. That's no question. But what to do with it? What are the values and the objectives? Uh, it's worth thinking about this uh, and converge all of these uh, um, trends and movements that are happening out there. So open to questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful uh, talk. The, uh, please have uh, any question about the Dr. Martin's lecture on the floor. Yeah, Professor Lee, Thank you for your, uh, let's give him a mic. Hyung Sung Lee from uh, Chungbul National University. Thank you for your excellent presentation. So, but I need to think about the cyber security issue. So, you may know about the accident in UK NHS. Uh, so at the time, some ransomware attacked the NHS mm -hmm. in yeah. maybe five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. So, and so, uh, what what do you think about that uh, extent? And after that, uh, UK or EU has a special uh, uh, task force to prevent that kind of activity. So, uh, some hacking issue. Yeah. 
Yeah, so regarding cybersecurity, um, you know, I have a, also a, a paper on that, on the global efforts for cybersecurity. I think we need to work at a global scale. When I was uh, participating in a lot of EU work, we created a, a working group for cybersecurity in health in 2019. And in 2020, we established a permanent working group for healthcare cybersecurity under the NIS directive, which is the Network and Information Security Directive. The NIS directive is now being negotiated for the second version. It's more aggressive. Uh, so more measures, more uh, demands. And also the European Agency for Cybersecurity has now a dedicated area of work and they produce guidelines for hospitals. But with the new legislation, these guidelines will no longer be voluntary, but they will become mandatory. So definitely a very strong emphasis. But the reason I started with global efforts is because most digital technology is produced worldwide. So we need to collaborate together uh, and create a space, and in that paper I suggest that WHO could be a forum for that, or the OECD, or even for our part of the world, NATO, because we need cross-continent cross, uh, um, efforts. Because when you have a problem early morning in Japan, if you warn people in Europe or in the US, we will have five hours or seven hours until all the doctors come into the hospitals to work. And this, in the case of the WannaCry, the, the difference between Portugal and, and the NHS in England was that we had a centralized organization, SPMS. So as soon as we knew about it, we shut down the entire health system because it's a private network. So I, I made two phone calls. Well, one was to listen to the minister, all scared up. Mm -hmm. And the second one is talk to the technician and say, activate the plan a complete plan, such as all emails and all the internet connection. So suddenly we were protected. So I think you, you can build and you do, the more we talk about digital, the more we need to talk about security, for sure. But also the more we put health care in digital, the more it's easy to find resources and money and political attention for cybersecurity in health. Otherwise, it's always considered a, a small topic. Uh, people talk about, you know, washing hands and patient safety and never think that cybersecurity is patient safety. Any other question? Yeah. There's a question over there. Vessel, you need to control for time because I'm sorry I, 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 yeah, I took I talk too much. A more time. A more minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's a short question. I'm Xuan Park from uh, Dangong University. Uh, everyone thought about uh, uh, digital patients only, but uh, I want to change some focus on about uh, digital doctorization. So maybe there's a digital patient, and we need also about the digital doctor. So yeah. what do you think about? Well, I think that unfortunately I couldn't put the slides because I had the slides on that. But, uh, but when I was choosing the topics, that's why earlier I said, well, I won't focus here. I, I do have some, some slides on that. I think that, honestly, there's two types that we need to think about. There's the, the professionals, doctors and others. I always use this, uh, this uh, I'm always careful with this, that are what I call bionic professionals. Okay? And I use this expression many times when I talk. So bionic professional is a professional that in order to practice needs to use digital. It's always somehow electric. And if you actually think about it, many of our healthcare professionals are already very bionic. There are some surgeons, they do not know how to operate without a robot da Vinci. There are some uh, pathologists, they cannot operate without digital technology. And, and there's no problem with that. And doctors have always lived well with the idea that they are bionic. They just don't call themselves like that. The second type of professionals, what I call robo-doctors or robo-nurses, uh, that is a little bit more scary. And whenever I have a talk about AI for professionals, I always say there's only two types of doctors or nurses. Those that will use AI and those that will be replaced by AI. Okay, and, and in this type of conference, those that help build AI. So these, these are my words. Now, do people want services that are provided by robots? I think so. 
I'm an internist. And I think some things I did to my patients, I would be very happy that a little robot could do them for me. And I think doctors do not need to be afraid of losing their job. They just need to change the nature of their job. Actually, they need to move to the emotional space, the caring space, much more as, as, in, as technology progresses and AI progresses, the cognitive decision-making part of medicine will be outsourced to the machines, possibly with positive results. So you don't need to be scared. You just need to focus on the other part where the machines, at least for now, and according to many people for a long, long time, will not surpass humans, which is emotional provision, emotional support. Now, many medical schools do not teach doctors about this. And that's why doctors are nervous and nurses the same. It's because they were not taught that the most important thing they can do to the patient is sit down, listen, and make, you know, make them feel better. So we need to change medical education to get new doctors that are robo slash bionic kind of professionals. Any other question? Is there so, any other questions? So many intelligent people. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Don't be shy. I know in Korea people don't ask a lot of questions, but it's Good. not, it's not typical so Korea. This is not typical Korea. This is Cosme. So people here, they, they are friends, and they can throw questions, stupid questions, intelligent uh, questions. Dr. Martin, I have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, said about a lot the metaverse. Yeah. So, do you think it could be a uh, real important thing in future medicine, or it could be some kind of temporary trend? I think, I think there's value in both. I think, there, it's, I think there is an element of temporarity trend, and I think if that is the case in this country, you should take advantage of that. And I know there are metaverse plans for Seoul, and there's, so, so you, should, you should ride that you, as we say it in Portugal, you should surf that wave because that wave at least gives you more research funds, more money, more attention. It's always good. Having said this, uh, one of my other students, by now you think how many? There's 21 masters and seven PhDs, so I can, I can, there's a lot of them. One of them, she just focused on VR for mental health. In, you know, it's a growing area. And it's with very positive impact, both cognitive perception, analysis, dementia, um, uh, cognitive training. Um, there's def definitely a lot of diseases that we do not know how to treat. And perhaps in the metaverse, we will do a better job. All of those that have to do with perceptions, I think, these, the per what I call perceptual diseases, I have a wrong perception of the world, they can be. And the other thing is that there are humans, okay, that want to spend time in this space. They are now playing games and we look at them, you know, Minecraft and, and Fortnite and Second Life and blah, blah, blah. But they want to live in that space. If we want to do, that's why I told about precision public health. If we want to convince adolescents uh, and we want to target adolescents for, for example, some preventive uh, sexual uh, health campaigns, we need to put our preventive nurses in the metaverse in the middle of the game. We need, for example, Minecraft, you cannot build a hospital on Minecraft. This is something that should be done. You know? So you, you, you have the shepherd, the guy that goes with the sheep, but you don't have the nurse. So these are small steps that these, I think, will be permanent, and they can be of permanent help. Thanks for the question. Any other question? Yeah, Professor Park, go ahead. Professor Park. <laughs> First of all, thank you for having my photo on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> and second, I would like to let you know that your name is N. There, Anne Lique Martins. So your first name is Anne from now on. Okay. Not Anne Lique. <laughs> Here comes my question. Um, you talked about personal data space, right? Yep. Now, who is governing personal data space? 
That's a very good question. So right now, there's, I, I would say there's at least two models emerging in Europe. A more governmental-driven model, like the one we have in Portugal, in the e Finland, uh, Sweden, Denmark for sure, uh, UK. So countries with a national health system, they are almost all of them creating uh, online space for people to put their data and then use their data to provide uh, to researchers or to other hospitals and so on. In countries like the Netherlands, um, for example, the model, uh, or even in Catalonia, which is not a country but a region of Spain, they went the way of patient associations and what we call um, data cooperatives. So these are, uh, these are con this concept is that, for example, in the case of the Netherlands, there's more than one IT system that is maintained and governed by a patient group. And you as a patient, you open your account there, and then the hospitals that you use are forced by law to put your data there. And you can request, that's why I talk about help that activism, you already have that right written in law. The GDPR has one article about data portability. The problem is, this is like human rights. You know, there's a, there's, I'm sure in the Constitution, everyone should be equal. But that doesn't mean you don't fight for it. You need to fight for your rights and also for your health data rights. So those are the two models right now. Um, now, we are afraid of the third model, which is what we call Google slash uh, um, Microsoft slash others. So in, in Europe is really worried about this third model because in Europe we believe that this is not a very good idea. Um, so, but this is also happening. So in countries that are more delayed, what happens is that people start to put their data in, in a server somewhere uh, uh, in, in the US. And, and actually by doing so, the data law right now is a little bit better because of the GDPR. But that's another issue. So I think, for me, the model, a hybrid model is perhaps the best. One thing I've learned from Portugal is that when we have a very governmental-based model, we don't get energy from the patient groups. So they don't campaign for the personal health data space. And that's why in this model that I presented, we talk about the personal health data space as an enabling space for empowerment not just as a box where you put the data. No, it's, it's a box, you put the data there to do something about your health. Yeah, so that's what I, I think is the best. Yeah, thank you. This uh, is time to close this session. So later, thank if you. we have uh, any other questions, you can email him. I bet he will kindly reply to you. Yeah, let's give him a big applause. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. <laughs>